morning. Glad to see everyone this morning. Cable First Baptist Church. Uh, in case you hadn't looked at the calendar, it's fall. Uh, I got up this morning and the TV said 41 degrees. I thought, well, that's not bad. So I looked at the, the leaves on trees and give it a this. So it's good sweater weather. You know what else it's good for? Soup. So we've got that pneumonia. Be positive, Larry. We've got your soup desire taken care of. Be back with us at 5 o'clock tonight for our Bible study. We're going to have soup and sandwiches afterwards. And I think we got taco. Taco, chili, homemade, homemade uh, chicken noodle, and vegetables. So, hey. Whatever you like. Just come eat with us. We're going to have our Bible study at five. When that's over, we're going to have a bowl of soup and enjoy our fellowship. So we look forward to seeing you this evening. If you will, take your uh, uh, bulletins this morning and let's look at those. Uh, WMU will meet this Friday at 2 p.m. Will they be here in the, in the uh, fellowship hall? Okay, here in the fellowship hall at 2 p.m. this Friday. All right, business meeting will be next Sunday evening. Does anyone have any other additions to our announcements this morning? Just take note that we have a new clerk for Mild Pennies. Mild Pennies is growing. There you go. Mild Pennies is growing, so that that goes for a, goes for an exceptional cause. Goes for an exceptional cause. All right. Let's look at our prayer list this morning. Do we have any additions or any updates to our prayer list? Okay, we we'll, won't we'll continue to remember Miss Mary and that, that that breathing is a difficult situation. Also, Miss Mary Duncan with uh, the pneumonia. Do we have any updates on her? She's at home, so we want to continue to pray for both of both of our Marys with the breathing situations right now. All right, are there any other updates? Keep Chris on your prayer list. Just telling us this morning some difficulties. Going to have to have some pinched nerves and things, and going to require some surgeries. And it's a not ever a pleasant thought, but thoughts and prayers will be with you on that. Jesus. Okay, I have an unspoken request. All right. All right, premature baby is gaining weight. Good deal, good deal. All right. Miss Sue Boney, Miss Sue fell this morning. I think that is that is almost a daily event, so please keep her in your thoughts and prayers as she's nursing some injuries and things. Going to the doctor tomorrow. Please remember Miss Sue Boney. All right, are there others? Everybody says prayers. Everybody's all bluttered. I'm over it, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> one thing, one thing to something else. All right, we'll remember you, sir. All right, are there others? All right. Please keep our, our community, our elderly, in, in mind. You know, as the days get short, the temperatures get cold, they're, they're inside a little bit more. Uh, be a great time to pick back up with our, our sending of cards and just. Let them know that someone's thinking about them. So a, a quick phone call, anything to brighten their day. All right. Let's uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of life, Lord. Things that we take for granted every day, our, our health, our, our happiness, uh, our ability to, to be mobile. Lord, we thank you for all these blessings. And Lord, we ask for your continued uh, oversight on these that are having trouble with those situations. Lord, we pray for these that are falling, Lord, that are having continued health concerns. Lord, we ask for your healing hand to be upon them. Lord, we pray for those that are that are further along in their diseases and things. Lord, we know those are many. Uh, ask for your guidance upon the doctors and the caregivers and the families as we go through this time. Lord, we pray for our church this morning that we might be a witness here in the community for you. Lord, we go upon this holiday season. We know it's a time when people do attend to attend church that may not do so on a regular basis we, Lord we pray that we would welcome them with open arms and be a place that they would feel welcomed and want to return to, to learn more about you and to worship. Lord lean guys as we go upon this hour. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. 
do nada. I was looking around for the children's room, and he said, I ain't got nothing. So that's quick enough. If you would, as we join together in worship, would you take your hymnal and please turn to hymn number 172? We sing the first, second, and final standards. 172. This is a song we can all sing with a great pride in our heart because there's no one like Jesus. 560, all four standards, please. <laughs> <coughs> Oh 
hymn this morning, Congregational Hymns, is hymn number 469. 469, we'll sing all three stanzas. Let's stand together as we sing. This may not be real favorite of yours, but it's a good hymn to sing. song and the meaning it has to all of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We thank you, dear Father, for the joy we have and and troubles may still come, Father, but we know there's an answer to every trouble we have and that's through the, the love of Jesus Christ that we can make each and every day. Father, go with us, be with the ones on our prayer list, help them in their times of need and help us all to minister to them to be possible. Father, lead God and direct us when we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Oh 
kids want to go to children's church, kids worship. They're leaving now. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you chose to be here at Campbell with us this morning. Uh, make yourself at home. We appreciate you being here. If you're watching online, we're glad that you joined us this morning as well. We can't leave off our online folks because uh, uh, we, have, we have viewers from, from many different places that tune in to our services, and we're thankful to have them as well. Well, this morning, I'm continuing on. We started last week. We're looking at verses that are taken out of context. Uh, some of them are the actual verses, but some of them are these Christian ease phrases that have made our way into our vocabulary that sound biblically, but they're not biblical at all. They, they, they sound kind of Christian-y, but, but they're not Christian at all. And so I'm kind of looking at those. And the one this morning, I don't know if, have you ever heard, don't judge me. Judge not lest you be judged. Only God can judge me. Our, our culture cannot get enough of the judge not that you be not judged verse. It, it, it's like you hear it everywhere. And those that mishandle this verse, they, they handle it and they use it to keep others at bay. Don't judge me. You don't know me. Only God can judge me. It's my life. Jesus says not to judge. I saw a lady at Pizza Inn a couple weeks ago. That's what her t-shirt said. Only God can judge me in like letters this big. And I'm right. He's going to and he is, lady. You can count on that. I don't know where you're at, but that's, that's a true statement. But for many people using this verse out of context, they use it like a credit card that has an unlimited amount and it allows them to justify living as they please without any regard for moral boundaries or accountability. What they're saying in actuality is this. Everyone should be able to do whatever he or she wants to do and no one should tell them that they can't. David Guzik says this, among those who seem to know nothing of the Bible, this is the verse that seems to be most popular. Yet most of the people who quote this verse don't understand what Jesus said. They seem to think or hope that Jesus commanded a universal acceptance of any lifestyle or teaching. The thing about this verse is it is mostly misused by lost people. I've heard some Christians use this out of context before, but most of the time it's unbelievers. You, you see celebrities and, 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 and musicians and, and actors and actresses, and you see them quoting this a lot of time on TV. You know, that's, that's what they say. And here's the problem. Well, there, there's several problems with this, with lost people using the scripture. One, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, second, lost people have no understanding of the word of God. And, and third, they stop with the first verse because most likely that is all they know and they have no clue of the context. So this morning, let's dive in. If you have your Bible, if you would turn to Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter seven. Matthew seven, verses one through six. This is Jesus speaking. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see a speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
Father, we thank you for the, our Sunday school time that we had time to fellowship and, and, and to dive into your word, Lord. And we, we just pray that, that something that is said here this morning, Father, will just touch our hearts and change it. Your word has that power and ability. And Father, I pray that Jesus Christ will be high and lifted up. He will be magnified, Father, today. We thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for your word, how precious it is. And Father, if there's someone here this morning that is lost, that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit that will speak to their hearts and convict their souls. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It is in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. These six verses I just read are part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And to understand what this passage means, it must be interpreted within the framework of the context of the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of like, we look at it like this. That, that's what, from Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, it's one sermon. And to understand these six verses, it must be understood in the entire context of the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, it, it's like when we go back to the Ten Commandments, say, you know, the Ten Commandments in Exodus, one of the Ten Commandments is do not murder. You have to understand that in the context of, of the Ten Commandments in that passage of the scripture. And what that says is, is you are not to physically take the life of another person, okay? And so uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it kind of breaks that down more, you know, like for self-defense and different things like that. It talks about that. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard that commandment of old, do not murder. But I tell you this, if you hate your brother in your heart, you have committed murder. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes it to, the, to a matter of the heart, not the physical. He's saying the physical act is wrong, but I, I've taken it even further that if you hate somebody in your heart, you have murdered them and you've broken the commandment. So, so one through six we got to take it, it's, it's framed within the Sermon on the Mount. And that's how we have to understand the context. The, the context is key to all scripture interpretation. It's original context in which it was taught. The Sermon on the Mount is all about what it means to live faithfully as a committed follower of Christ. Jesus is telling believers that they're to live differently. He, he's proclaiming a high moral standard that is consistent with what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so he sets up a strong moral ethic that reflects what it means to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, how you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And he spends a lot of time talking about the motives of the heart. What's in our heart? Because Jesus says, what's in our heart that's what's manifested. It's what comes out. Now, there was another group that day listening to the Sermon on the Mount. Another group was in attendance that day, and Jesus was specifically speaking in their direction also. That group was the Pharisees. And he spoke on the motives of the heart. He was also rebuking their hypocrisy. <clears throat> Because the Pharisees were quick to see the sins of others, but they were blind and unwilling to hold themselves accountable to the same standards that they were imposing on everyone else. So if you have your handout in your bulletin or if you download the U version uh, handout on our online, well, let's look at number one. The question is to judge or not to judge. Let's look at the first two verses. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged with, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So when an individual or group of people develop their own religion and morality, they will always begin to judge others by those self-made standards. 
And the Pharisees, they were notorious for condemning the shortcomings of others when all the while they were the ones who stood condemned because they were doing the same thing or worse. Jesus said that judgment always reciprocates. It always comes back to you. The measuring stick the Pharisees used to judge the lives of others, it was the same measuring stick held against their own lives by God. In Matthew 5, 20, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called for a righteousness that was greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. In, 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 the, in the way some people think, the, the way to make oneself more righteous is to be judgmental of others. And Jesus, he, he's rebuking that kind of thinking. So the very beginning of verse one, which by the way, it's a command, he warns against passing judgment upon others in a harsh, critical spirit. So let's just get to the big question. Is all judging prohibited? Is it true? Don't judge me. Is, is all judgment prohibited? Well, the short answer to that is no. And let me explain. So hang with me this morning. In order to answer this question, we must know the difference between self-righteous, hypocritical judging and good moral judgments. There's a difference. Self-righteous, hypocritical judging is sinful and is prohibited by the scripture. Why? Because we are not God. And here's what verse one means. Judge not that you be not judged by God. The point is that God is the ultimate judge, not you or me. And when we sinfully judge others, we take on the role of God and we're assuming that we know all the facts and that we understand the other person's motives perfectly and we don't, we can't, it's an impossibility. But verse two makes it clear that if we judge others with a high standard, then we should expect God to judge us in the same way. So we are prohibited from making self-righteous, hypocritical judgments. But, but the other question is, but does this passage prohibit us from making good moral judgments? Which the answer to that is no, it does not. Can, can, can we not speak up against sin? Yes, we can. And there are many verses that encourage us to make good moral judgments. Matthew 7, 15 through 16. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Jesus is saying you need to judge these, make good moral judgments against false prophets because they will destroy you. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gain your brother. Galatians 6, 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you also be tempted. Romans 16, 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. John 7, 24. Jesus was being criticized for his teaching, and, and he says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. 1 Corinthians 5, 1. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. So, so here, there's many verses that call us to make good moral judgments. And it's wrong to take Matthew 7, 1 out of context and proclaim that Christ is teaching that Christians should accept everyone's morality and never speak out against sin. These verses do not prohibit examining the lives of others, but what it does, it prohibits doing it in the spirit that is often done in. We, we break this command when we think the worst of others. We break this command when we only speak to others of their fault. We break this command when we judge an entire life only by its worst moments. We break this command when we judge the hidden motives of others. 
We break this command when we judge others without considering ourselves in their same circumstances. We break this command when we judge others without being mindful that we ourselves will be judged. But here's the thing. Jesus is not suggesting that we do not have the right to make moral judgment about human behavior. And he is also not suggesting that we don't have the right to hold our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ accountable. So this passage, these six verses, in its context, it is not about judging others. But what this passage is about, it's about avoiding hypocrisy and living a life of accountability. This, this whole context, it's about avoiding hypocrisy and living the life of of accountability. But here is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. Number two, speck versus plank. Verses three through five. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, see what a difference that makes when you go past verse one? It, it just changes. I mean, when you read that and you read it in its entirety, you're like, huh, that, that kind of makes sense. But when you just stop it at verse one, you lose everything about that passage. It, it, it's way easier to point out the sins of others rather than the better own, right, church? <laughs> I can, I can, listen, I, I, I would just, you know, you can just pick people, you go to the mall or something, just sit there and just like, it, it's easier to do because we don't like to admit our own. Now the word speck, it also is translated as splinter. Ever, anybody ever had a splinter before? It, just think of the size of a splinter. Now it's teeny tiny, but it's really annoying when you get one in your hand. But just think about that. Sometimes you need a magnifying glass and, and tweezers and a needle to even see it to pick it out. The word plank, it's translated as log or beam. And a plank was a massive piece of timber used for supporting a roof. Now, just kind of get that picture what Jesus... Can you imagine somebody just with, with a beam coming out of their eyeball, Right? <laughs> Just, just picture that. They're just like, you know. And so, so but, but think of the comparison. The splinter, which is microscopic sometimes, to a beam that's huge. You and I cannot approach a Christian brother or sister about their specific sin if we are committing the same sin and unwilling to address it or to break free from it. We can't. We must take a spiritual inventory of our own lives and clean up our own sins before we can address the sins of a brother or sister in Christ. Many have taken this metaphor to mean that Christians should never correct anyone. However, Jesus' point was this. While we all have sin in our lives, we are responsible for dealing with our own sin first and then help others. Do you see... Take the speck out of your, let's see, uh, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own? Or, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? Verse five, he says, you hypocrite. First, first thing you do, you take inventory of your own life. You <laughs> repent of your sins. You clean your act up. Take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When you remove that big log out of your own eye, you have full vision because you've done spiritual inventory. You see, it's about being accountable to God and to each other. It's about being transparent. It's about iron sharpening iron. It's about doing life together so that we can grow spiritually. It's about allowing others to point out our blind spots without getting mad about it. It's about accepting the responsibility of our sins and confessing them and then repenting of them. 
And we don't like to talk about a candidate because what we do is, one, we get mad if anybody says anything to us because you're meddling. And there's anger, but here's the thing. Accountability is biblical. I've only, I've had maybe three people in my entire life that have full permission to go anywhere they want to go with my life. They can ask me anything that they want. They can check on me at any time. And, and, and I, I, I can't get mad. If I get mad, then, then, then I've, I've lied about, I've, I've told them. I said, look, you, you have to hold me accountable. This is where I struggle. Ask me how I'm doing. And you got to be ready when they say, you know, they ask you. We need people like that in our lives. We don't like accountability because that means we open up our lives to others. We're often scared of what people will think or sadly what they may say in the form of gossip. Listen, there's been times in my life early on, early on when, when Sherry and I were first married and we were having a real, real hard time in the church that we were at, we pretended like everything was okay because there were some people there that they were more interested in the gossip and spreading that gossip than truly interested in helping us in our marriage. And that's sad, church, because this is the one place that we should be able to come and say, you know what, I'm broken and I'm struggling. And, and, and this sin is, 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 is messing me up. And somebody come along beside us and said, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to war. I'm going to battle for you. I'm going to keep checking on you. Instead of, instead of getting on the telephone or texting message and sending a group, can you believe what's happened to so-and-so? And, and here's what we often do. We disguise it in the form of a prayer request. Right? We do. I've seen it happen. Well, you need to pray for so-and-so. What's wrong? Oh, you're not going to believe this. Listen, gossip's a sin, church. That's just straight up it is. Whether you text it, whether you do it on Facebook, whether, whether we do it in person, it's a sin. Just like taking a gun, shooting somebody, it's, it's, it's murdering them, it's a sin. And shame on us. When a brother and sister in Christ is hurting and has sinned and fallen, and we want to use that against them? And that's what happens is, is, is so many people come into church, and they're like, how you doing? They're like, well, we're okay. Right? Fake smile, mask on, and on the inside, they're devastated, and they're crushed, and they're broken because they're afraid of what people will say. Another problem is this. Something that we face is often our lives are in such disarray that when it comes to Jesus, that we're ineffective in helping others. We can't help others because our own lives are such a mess. We have no biblical right to correct anyone. Also, the person with the speck must be willing to have someone help them. Any restriction for them, that will make accountability impossible. This is what Proverbs 13, 18 says. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. See, that person that you go to, that person that you want to talk to, that person that you seek to restore, they, they got to be able to accept that. And, and when someone comes to us and, and we don't expect, this is what Proverbs says that, that, it's a disgrace that honor ignores instruction. Proverbs 15, 32, whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. Ecclesiastes 7, 5, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. James 5, 19, 20, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save the soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. When accountability is mentioned, folks, they have a tendency to run and hide. We, we don't want other people in our business, but accountability, it's biblical. 
And biblical accountability confronting sin in the life of a believer is an attempt to restore a relationship with a brother or sister in Christ so that they may have a wonderful fellowship with God that is unhindered or uninterrupted by sin. See, it's all about reconciliation. Reconciliation is the heartbeat of the gospel. These two verses about the speck and the plank point to the gospel. It's about being reconciled with God. Our sins should break us. Our sins should drive us to our knees to repentance. And while we're here on this planet, we will never be perfect. But it's important that we live a life of consistency and integrity in order to safeguard the name of Christ, who we represent. We are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Learned that in RAs when I was about this tall, right? We also have the reputation of Christ's church at stake too. We might not often think about that, but we should. We represent Christ. We represent his church. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I'm not going up to that church. A bunch of hypocrites up there. Do you know what so-and-so up there does? I've heard that before too. And before we can effectively help anyone, we must clean up ourselves. So how do we take the log out of our own eye? We look to the cross. When we look to the cross and we see Jesus hanging there for us, we see what our sins really deserve. And we see how God sees our sin. And we also see that we are forgiven and loved by God through Christ. You see, it is impossible for us to look at the cross and be self-righteous and critical at the same time. You cannot look at the cross of Christ and be self-righteous and critical at the same time. When we look at the cross, we can then look at our brother or sisters and there will be no sense of superiority and there will be no desire to make ourselves look better than them. When we look to the cross, we see how destructive sin is. So we repent of our own sin. Then we put ourselves in a position to help other Christians repent of their sins because we don't want to see them destroyed by it. We're cruising along through the first five verses. And then we have verse six. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Verse six, it is one of those Bible verses you read and it seems really out of place and very obscure. What in the world do dogs, pigs, and pearls have to do with accountability, hypocrisy, and the gospel? Number three, pearl-wearing pigs. <laughs> Believers are not to judge others' internal motives because we don't know the heart. Yet Jesus warns against a complete lack of discernment about people's attitudes toward the gospel. We might say that Jesus means don't be judgmental, but don't throw out all discernment either. There's a difference between judging other people's motives and using discernment. So let's look at dogs, pigs, and pearls. Uh, a few weeks ago, gosh, well, about a month ago, we were in Destin on fall break. We're shopping and we notice a man and his dog. You might be thinking, what's the big deal? It's nothing. People shop with their dogs all the time. Well, let me tell you, this dog was wearing a tiara, a tutu, and pearls, and was riding in a stroller. <laughs> Listen, I love my pet as much as the next person, but that's a little too much. That dude needed some help. <laughs> but when we read about dogs in the Bible, you need to toss out any and all knowledge of dogs in our country. Because our dogs, listen to me, our dogs live better than most people in other countries. They do. So dogs during Jesus' time were not household pets. First time I went to Africa, I saw dogs there. They were looking a little scrunchy, mangy, little brown, dingo-looking dog. They're all the same. Went to Haiti, same dog there. Nasty, just 
despise. They throw rocks at them. They kick them. They run them off. They don't want anything to do with them. What I'm saying is this, is you'd never see Fluffy wearing a tutu riding in a stroller in a third world country, okay? So, so in Haiti, they're a nuisance and they're a walking worm and parasite farm, okay? You, you could probably squeeze on them dudes and who knows what kind of parasites would come out. I think you get the picture. Dogs were wild scavengers. They were dangerous and they were never pets. Matter of fact, if you were called dog in the scripture, that was a great insult. What about pigs? Well, I think you know about pigs. Pigs were the epitome of uncleanliness for the Jews. The Jews were not even allowed to touch a pig or they would also become unclean. And then there's pearls. He talks about pearls. Well, pearls were more valuable than diamonds. They were a precious commodity and you would never, ever, ever give pearls to a dog or a pig. Pigs were also dangerous with their hooves and tusks. If you gave them pearls, they would eat them. Then they would realize that they were not food. They'd spit them back in the mud and they would trample them. And the dog or the pig would probably resent the pearls since they can't eat them and they will attack the giver. So who was Jesus referring to as the dogs and pigs in verse 6? Well, the dogs and the pigs are the unholy people who, when presented with the gospel, treat it with scorn and contempt. Contemptuous, evil people cannot grasp the value of the gospel, so they scornfully cast it away. So does this mean that we shouldn't share the gospel? That would be a big, fat no. We don't stop sharing the gospel to unbelievers. But we are to be wise and discerning so we do not bring scorn to God's message. We are to be discerning when we present things that are holy before those who will trample it. In other words, if, if we tell someone about Jesus and they continually oppose us, we move on. We move on. Jesus instructed his disciples in this very matter when he sent them out evangelizing to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, 14. He said that if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. He's like, you share the gospel with them. If they won't receive them, move on. Move on. When a person rejects the gospel, and they will reject the gospel, it should break our heart. Jesus, he wept over Jerusalem in Luke 19, 41, 42. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how I wanted so much to gather you up like a mother hen gathers up a brood under her wings, but you rejected me. We should weep for the lost as well. We should pray for their salvation, but we move on. We don't hang around and debate them. We don't argue with them. We don't try to show them how much about the Bible we know and, and how little they know. This is big today. We, we don't get into social media comment arguments with internet trolls. You, you know, if you don't know, familiar with the term internet troll, I'll, I'll give you a little, little class here. An internet troll is a person that just goes to whoever's comment sections. It doesn't matter who it is, what the conversation's about. They just go and they post some kind of hateful comment and what they're doing is they're trolling you. What are they trolling? They want you to reply back. And it's kind of like they cast, they, they put that little comment out there and they sit there and they watch the bobber and there you are sitting at the keyboard and it's all... Oh, I'm going to get them, and you start typing their reply, and you hit send, and they're like, zzzz, and they're really in, and then they come back, and they start typing, and it's on. 40 minutes later, you're still arguing with this person, and they've trolled you. They, they, that's what they want to do. Listen, we, our Facebook page is, is not real, real bad. We don't really have a lot. We kind of can moderate the comments. YouTube, there's been a couple of, of internet trolls on our YouTube. But I have the settings on that that uh, I have to review the comment first before it actually gets posted to the public to see. But there's a few people out there that, 
just like, you know, they'll find something about a sermon or, or they'll make a comment about the Bible or something obscure. They don't want to know, okay? It's like, shouldn't you answer them? No. Shouldn't I reply because this person's like, it's taking that verse out of context and they're saying this about Jesus. Shouldn't I like share with them? No, because they don't want to know. They, they just, they just want to argue. They want to take what's precious and they want to trample it underfoot. We don't cast our pearls before the swine or give what is holy to the dogs. We move on and find others who are interested in hearing the gospel. And as we navigate through Matthew 7, 1 through 6, and we apply this to our daily lives, this is the guiding factor. This is the ingredients to the recipe. Number four, grace, gentleness, and love seeds me. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Galatians 6, 1 also says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. The Christian is called to show unconditional love, but the Christian is not called to unconditional approval. There's a big difference. Our culture tells us that if we disagree with someone's sinful lifestyle, we don't love them. And that's a big, fat lie. You can love people who are doing things that should not be approved of. As a matter of fact, the reason why you don't approve is because you love them. And because you know that that sin will destroy them if they continue on. Because in your heart, you truly desire for them to be reconciled to God. Listen, if I, did, if I didn't love someone, I would just say, you know what? You just go about doing what, yeah, you're right. You be you, man. You be you. I, I approve of that. That's what the culture says. Uh, you you got to approve of what I'm doing, even though it's wrong. You can't, you can't say that it's wrong. You got to approve it. Because if you don't approve it, then you don't really love. The Bible says differently. You can still love people and you share the truth with them because you love them. That there's a right way to approach them and there's a wrong way to approach them. That the wrong way is by exerting a self-righteous, hateful, critical, judging attitude. You, you accomplish nothing with this method. Matter of fact, you just drive the person further and further away. The right way is this is you smother it in prayer and love and always make sure it is seasoned in grace and gentleness. When we speak out against sin, when we confront a fellow believer, when we try to practice biblical accountability, it must always be seasoned with grace, gentleness, and love. And, and, and just using the recipe metaphor, I don't think you can put too much on it. I don't think, you know, I'm just going to do a little teaspoon, a little tablespoon. Might use a cup. Listen, dump the whole container out on them. Dump the whole container out. It's all right. You won't ruin it. You won't ruin the recipe. Because the ultimate goal is restoration and reconciliation. That's the ultimate goal, church. That should be our heart. If we can just wrap all this up, kind of summarize it, Jesus does not forbid all moral judgment or accountability. He does forbid harsh, prideful, and hypocritical judgment that condemns others without first evaluating one's own spiritual condition. But here's the thing, the misuse of do, the misuse of do not judge it is just an indicator of a larger problem. It reveals how far the disciple of sound biblical study has slipped in recent years. And more than that, it sheds light on the state of our culture. It is a culture that seeks to avoid accountability and responsibility for personal actions. Our, our culture is all about let's blame in somebody else. Our culture is not about taking accountability. It's always somebody else's fault. But here's the thing. It all points back to sin always 
Sin is always at the heart of the matter. But here's the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a Savior who died for you and me. There is forgiveness for all sins. And there is restoration found in Jesus. If you would, if you would stand with me this morning as we have our time of invitation. This morning, I want you to...